<clears throat> First off, I just want to thank everybody for being here. I know it's late in the day, and uh, having everybody here is what makes it possible, so I really just appreciate you all being here. So now we're designing and abusing legacy Microsoft transports and session architecture. Um, that's what this is going to be about, but a little bit about me is, uh, first and foremost, um, I'm a principal red teamer at Equinix, and I know we have a lot of Equinix people here, so I definitely want to give a shout out and definitely thank the support I get from them. Um, also, I uh, was a student at Sam Houston State University, uh, computer science, they have a great department, and uh, several faculty, yeah, several faculty are goons here and have been for a really long time, so uh, definitely uh, appreciate them. I uh, want to reach out to their shout out to Black Birch. Um, they do great pen testing consulting. Um, you know, so that's kind of my background is I do a lot of red teaming, consulting, uh, coding, developing, all that sort of stuff. And primarily, I like to stick to Python or C++. Um, and in this case, we're going to be looking at, you know, some of the challenges that red teamers face because uh, um, we need to compromise endpoints and networks, and then we need to, you know, exfiltrate data. We need, but the thing about the red teaming is that everything is in scope, and nobody knows that we're coming, um, and so remaining undetected is a key part, or at least maintaining our access. If we're detected, the gig's kind of up, especially being, um, you know, not a legit bad guy, because you really only get one chance. You know, once the blue teamers know about it, it's kind of game over. Um, but anyway, so if we, you know, use like uh, traditional frameworks and stuff for a C2, that's great. We definitely want to do that. Um, but what if those channels are compromised um, and what are the key things that those things do? They reach out to your C2 server, even if it's over an extended period of time. Um, if that's ever picked up, then you kind of lose everything. So the focus on this is looking at implementing, you know, multiple, you know, TDPs. Um, at different levels and provide enough functionality to allow us to regain access uh, to machines where we maybe have lost it or just to simply do something without having any sort of the indicators that would result from a process reaching out to the internet or another server um, for a tasking. Um, just some prerequisite high level overview. We do abuse some of the things um, within Windows. And so um, I'm going to be covering at a high level uh, windows like sessions uh, and their stations, tokens, things like that. But then also there's some other protocols that we're going to cover. Um, it's pretty simple. The first thing we're going to look at is, uh, you know, the different sessions. Um, when a user logs into a windows machine, they're going to have their own logon session. And so if there's, you know, terminal services or multiple users can log in over RDP as an example, then you'll have a different session for each one of those users. So what if we have a service like an implant that's running in session zero and we want to create a process inside of another user session? Maybe a session is just logged in. Can we do that from session zero? Which is basically where all the services log in or where they're running. So that's going to be one of the main topics that we talk about today is how can we achieve this and what are the best ways to do it and what is the, uh, what are our abilities to detect it as well? Um, which brings me to a framework that I've been working on and uh, as soon as I get back to my room I'll release the code in my github so it'll be available. It's written in C++. Um, there's a, uh, com a command line agent but then also I've been implementing a uh, graphical um, front end using I'm GUI. So that'll be available but just kind of a high level overview of this is that um, again it's for long term persistent access in case we need to recover it. But the main thing is that it doesn't reach out to a C2 server. It sits there on the endpoint running and then it waits for tasking. So um, we abuse some other different protocols within it to keep the network association away from the process and we're going to go through that in more detail. But the way that we're um, doing it is that we're supporting or the main thing is that we wanted to support um, the ability to implement different types of transports. So what if a specific transport only allows ingress? We still want this functionality. So um, there's a custom messaging protocol that's implemented and the main takeaways is that an operator can issue a task and the task is going to be sent to the implant and it's going to do something. Um, and the way that that is delivered is through a route. Notifications those are the responses and those are optional. So that's one of the key things is that you don't have to get a response from a task. 
So again, bidirectional transports, think of stateful protocols such as TCP. You know, you have your SYN, your SYNAC, and your ACK, right? You have, you know, transmission back and forth between the two. Um, but then in a unidirectional, you would have stateless protocols such as UDP, or in the main, the main one that we're going to use now, um, there are mail slots. And so those only require data being sent to the implant versus back and forth. So this actually gives us a lot of flexibility in that we can send a task off to a machine that's implanted and then not receive a response at all if we don't care about it. But if we do want to receive a response, we can have it sent back to a different machine um, over a different transport altogether. So we have a lot of flexibility and we're not tied to uh, anything specific. Really anything that, uh, you know, any sort of protocol that, you know, uses the network, we can implement um, as a transport layer. So tasks, this is like one of the key components. So again, these are inbound. So it's a message being received by the implant. The implant then does something based on whatever you're tasking it to do. Create a process uh, in a user's logon session um, or it creates a user, which obviously isn't very stealthy, but again, it's an option. So one of the questions is since the messaging protocol is decoupled from the transport layer, how can we deliver a response, especially when considering a transport is unidirectional. This is where routes come into play. So within a, um, an obligato implant, you have routes which describe a destination. And this would include all the information that's required to actually you know, send that information off to it. So for instance, a mail slot, we would include the NetBIOS name of the machine and then um, the name of the mail slot. I'm not going to spend too much time on this because we're going to get to it. We're going to have demos, which is probably going to clear a lot of this up. But the main thing is that each route entry is mapped to a unique identifier, and this is look. Uh, this is used in route lookups. And then the notifications is the last piece. So if you send off a task and you want to have like a response, you want to know if it executed successfully or what happened, uh, or just to receive data back, then you can say, "Hey, send me a notification." over this transport to this destination. So I'm going to talk about mail slots a little bit. Why do we want to use mail slots? Well, here's a quote uh, uh, from Microsoft. Uh, Remote mail slot protocol is a simple, unreliable, insecure, and unidirectional interprocess communication protocol between client and the server. A mail slot is represented locally on the server as a file. So you read that and you're like, well, maybe we shouldn't use it. Um, but there's actually a lot of advantages to using mail slots. So one thing about a mail slot um, is that the traffic isn't associated with the process. So normally, like, and we're going to demo this later, but normally if you have network activity through one way or another, you're going to have that associated with the process. So in this case, it doesn't, uh, which is really good for us because we're, again, we're decut, we're, we're um, not creating a v the path of, or I'm sorry, we're the process isn't associated with network activity. So as defenders dig into this, we're trying to break those process chain of events and the network activity. So this isn't going to be associated. Um, also, it's a very legacy, so it supports Windows 2000 APIs. So we could potentially use this on a wide range of machines. Um, one key thing if you go to implement um, this in development is that uh, you have to use the NetBIOS name. You can't use the IP address. Um, even if you look in Wireshark and you see, oops, if you see that the packets are being sent and they're being delivered to the endpoint, they're not processed correctly. And so the very big thing about uh, mail slots is that you have to use the NetBIOS name. Um, otherwise, it'll fail, but you'll see the network traffic. Um, but it won't be delivered to your process for processing. This is an extremely legacy protocol, so auth authentication isn't required, nor is it supported. I guess that was left to people that implemented the protocol themselves. So that's going to bring me to my first demo. I hope. 
Okay. Yeah, skip the okay. Um Okay. Well it looks like the videos aren't synced down, so we're gonna have to skip the demos. Uh well demo one was basically to show um the usage of the uh of the tool and using mail slots to task a remote agent. Um, and it worked. <laughs> the demos are available for download so uh, you can download those and check it if you want. But um, in the last demo if we could have seen it what we would have seen is one machine sending a task to another one that was implanted and then it doing something. Whenever I was creating my DEF CON uh, submission I came across an article with this quote and it was the first link after uh, searching mail slots. And it, it gave me pause. Um, I was thinking, hmm, so with the release of Windows 11 inside a preview build 2.25.3.14, we have started disabling the remote mail slot protocol by default. Mm -hmm. This is a precursor to deprecation and eventual removal from Windows. You aren't using this extremely legacy protocol unless you're also using the deprecated and disabled by default SMBV1 protocol. So 99.97% of you have nothing to worry about. Uh, this was a principal program manager. Um, yeah. So it gave me pause because I was thinking kind of like Byte leader said in his talk this morning is like am I the idiot? <laughs> am I a dumb dumb? Uh, did I somehow configure all these default windows boxes with SMB v1 enabled? So I checked and that would bring me to the demo too. <laughs> And uh, let me just illustrate verbally the best I can. Oops. In demo two, we were going to look at um, actually showing through PowerShell that on Windows 11, 10, and Windows Server uh, 2016, that SMBV1 uh, not only wasn't enabled, but on the server even, it wasn't installed. And then it worked. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Sorry about the demos. Um, I believe we also looked at in Wireshark that these, that we were actually using the mail slot protocol. They're being delivered um, over uh, NetBIOS um, and SMB. So even though SMB v1 was disabled, our packets were still sent to the endpoints and they were processed and the task was carried out. So, I'm not poking fun at whoever said this, but the thing is, is that as a defender wanting to potentially, you know, potentially block this activity or ensure that your environment isn't susceptible to communication over this medium, be careful when you come across this article and what the assumptions we draw from it because every single link was either this one or one pointing to it. Okay. S391. In where? No. Mm -hmm. It's all good. It's all good. Oh, it is, isn't it? Hey, there we go. All right. Thank you. Well, let's just circle back then. Hey, there we go. Awesome. Thank you, whoever said that. Appreciate it. Thanks.
Okay, so this is the tool. We're on a Windows 11 machine. We're configuring it to use a mail slot. This is the system that we're going to go ahead and target, Windows Server. Um, we're just going to create a user. Uh, not really worried about OPSEC at this point. We're just demoing the, the, you know, the, the usage of it. So we're going to create a user DEFCON 31, appropriate, with a super secure password. We're going to execute it. Again, this was a mail slot. And then we're going to look, and it was successful. DEFCON 31. Now I want to pause really quick. Um, I forgot to point out. So, um, yeah, you can see my mouse. So you can see here we're we're this is the target. So over here we created these different um, targets here. So we have mail slot and UDP. These are the ones we're going to target. And so this is what's being selected. And so in that case it was a mail slot and it worked. Now what we're going to do is um, that was the GUI. We're going to show off the uh, command line usage to show that you have the same functionality. So in this case we created a uh, mail slot listener. So we have like the service running, you know, the implants running as a service on these different machines, but you can also use the command line agent to set up a listener if you want to receive a response um, or even set it up for tasking. So in this case we just want to receive a response so we set up a listener there. And then in this case, this is another key component that you don't really see within the GUI because it's, it's um, done in the background, but the first thing that we have to do before we send a task um, when we want the response is that we have to send or we have to create a route. And so in this case we're targeting the Windows server. Uh, we're saying that this is obligato is the mail slot and um, we want to receive responses um, to this Windows 11 uh, box with OB receive as the mail slot. So basically if we task the server and we ask for a response, here's where you can send it. And then we can reference this ID in subsequent tasking and if that ID matches a route, then it's going to use that route for a response. So in this case we're going to um, add group membership. So we're going to take that user that we created and we're going to add them to local administrators and we're um, asking to receive a response uh, to our listener here. So if all goes well, we're going to execute this and then we'll see a response. And all of this is using mail slots. And remember this is demo one and demo two. We're going to be looking at uh, <laughs> whether or not SMB is enabled. Okay, so it's successful. Okay, and that was that. I uh, appreciate it. So I'm going to go ahead and cut it there because it's really just showing some other functionality um, but for time's sake. And so what I want to do now is just show demo two. And this was after reading the message that uh, Microsoft, you know, uh, you know, I think it's trying to download them each time. Here's, I'm just going to open up each one and let them queue. You know what's funny about this is I thought that the video route would be safer since I had to use multiple virtual machines and everything, but uh, I think the live might have been better. <laughs> All right, let's try it again. Okay. So again, um, going back to that message, SMB v1 has to be enabled in order to use mail slots. As we can see on this Windows 11 machine, SMB1 protocol, stay disabled. Windows 10. That's me one protocol. Stay disabled. Stay disabled.
Now just to kind of further demonstrate this, we're going to pull up Wireshark. Uh, I'm going to put in a little filter just so we, you know, kind of filter some stuff out. We're only going to see communication between the server and the endpoint where we're sending uh, the tasks. So we're going to pull up the GUI again. Create a local user. Really awesome password. <laughs> Just want to make sure it was running. All right, now we see the traffic. So we can see the NetBIOS traffic, um, and then we see the Mio Mel Slack communication. And so again, this was disabled. However, we do see the packets. Uh, we have the SMB headers here. Uh, SMB v1 is disabled. Yeah, we're still receiving these. Um, and then, of course, there's like we're saying, hey, create this uh, local user along with this password. And it was successful. So the main takeaway from this point is that, and I'm just gonna queue this up. The main point for this is that uh, we don't want to assume that SMB, or I'm sorry, mail slots won't work within our environment just because we have SMB v2 disabled, or v1 disabled. So, um, that's the reason why I threw this in here. Um, next, we want to look at uh, Windows logon session compromise. So we have like a good transport. Again, you can use multiple transports. In this case, you know, mail slots. But the next thing we want to look at um, to provide functionality is we want to be able to compromise logon sessions. So two key things uh, within any engagement really is that we're going to have it. We're going to have you know objectives that we have to get to, whether that's specific servers or information or you know users uh, there's going to be some sort of objective that that you know we have to meet <laughs> and within that a lot of the times what it's going to have is that we're going to have to elevate our permissions and we're going to have to move laterally to other endpoints and usually those two things play together we're going to have like limited access but then that's going to have admin access here we're going to get to that one there's going to be privileged users you know and so that's kind of the game is that we elevate privileges um, by compromising other user sessions or credentials. So the credential route is often through um, dumping credentials through LSAS. I'm sure everybody's familiar with that. Um, or LSA secret, CAS credentials, et cetera. Um, and then also log on sessions, which is, a, which is another method, um, which is basically us gaining code execution uh, in the target user's window log on session. And just to kind of look back, remember that each logon session in Windows is now kind of isolated from each other. So there's a few mainstream te techniques for this, um, for gaining code execution in a logon session. One is um, execute um, code in a process already running in the logon session, or we can open a handle to the process, duplicate the token, and then we can use impersonation or we can just, you know, create a process. But here's the question that um, I want to ask is what if we want to create a process on demand inside a target user's logon session without executing code in it or opening a handle to another process? So basically we want to have all that, you know, functionality but we don't want to touch other processes, um, tokens um, within an existing process of the session. So one method is looking, is we can use a task scheduler. Um, this isn't the method we're using behind the scenes. This is just an example. Um, and so what we would do is we could create a scheduled task to run as a target user. Um, we can set it to only run if the user's logged in and then there's not a credential requirement. If we try to have it run whenever a user's logged in, then obviously you need credentials. Um, the key thing on this is that when the process is created, it's going to be using the WinST0 in default desktop. And so if your process has any sort of uh, windows associated with it, those will be displayed to the user. In some cases, this may be desired. Um, for instance, if you're wanting to gather credentials, you could have a fake login prompt open, you know, whatever. But uh, in a lot of cases, you may not want them to be privy to anything that's executing in the background. So this wouldn't really be viable. Uh, at least I'm not sure how you could actually specify that, but. Um, 
Also, the process chain makes it pretty obvious what created the process. We're going to look at this in the next demo, but basically task goes W, which is associated with the task scheduler. Um, it's going to have the same parent process of um, the same SVC host process as the processes, process that is created. So from like an artist fact perspective, it's pretty obvious to see the process chain of events. Um, also, Windows you know, Task Scheduler creates a lot of um, events that can be observed and scrutinized, and this technique has been around for a really long time. So I'm just going to go ahead and demo that really quick, showing that usage. Okay, so we have a domain admin logged into the machine, and that's who we're going to want to target. Right now, we have um, admin access to the same server. These two servers are the same, just different login sessions, but we're, you know, a low privileged user. But we do have admin access to the server. So what we want to do is we want to have code execution within the login session of the domain admin. So we're just going to use Process Explorer to show the association of, you know, task scheduler. Um, process along with the process that's executed. I already created this one just for time's sake and so um, we're going to be executing this scheduled task as the domain admin only when they're logged in and the actions is we're going to make it open calc. So if this is successful then it should open up CMD and calc. I'm using slash K just so the process doesn't exit so we can observe it. Okay, and as you can see, let me cut a little short just for time's sake, um, but as you can see that CMD um, was um, executed um, within the logon session of the domain admin, so we do have code execution within that logon session or that user's logon session, which is great, but as you can see, uh, the parrot process is associated with both our process and the task host. And so um, that right there is what we want to break up. We want to be able to specify who the parent is and we want um, it to be believable. So I'm just going to close that for now. Queue up demo four. Yeah. So let's add on to our original question because there's some downsides to the task host. Good. There's some downsides to the task host and that is that it creates a lot of activity on the endpoint that we may want to uh, break. So adding to the original question, we want to do that and um, not generate the obvious event logs. We only want to display windows to the end user if we want to and we want to specify the parent creator process and on some levels we want to evade ETW or other like visibility. And so that's going to be the goal. Demo four. So I'm going to open up Process Monitor. The key thing about Process Monitor is that um, it uses Windows drivers for the collection of everything, ex I believe, except for the network activity. The network activity is actually ETW. So um, the filter that you can see here is um, observice.exe. That's our implant service um, or process. And then we have Explorer. That's going to be the process that we want to spoof. We want the parent to look like explorer.exe. So if all goes well, we're not going to see anything around OB service and everything is going to be associated with explore.exe. Explore.exe can be anything, but that's what we're using for the demo. So we're going to start that up. We're going to go ahead and spawn a process into a user session. In this case, we're just going to make CMD execute dir, but it could be anything. And now we're targeting the user where we have process monitor running. Execute it. Okay. 
So as we can see, nothing around OB service. We remotely, over mail slots, we sent a uh, task to our um, implant and we had it execute a service or a process. And not only do we not see any sort of network activity recorded because we're using mail slots, but we are also successfully spoofing the parent uh, process and it's so it's not recorded here. Explorer.exe had nothing to do with the execution of CMD. Um, but this, but process monitor, it believes it does. <laughs> Thanks. You should have. And for time's sake, I'm going to go ahead and kind of fast forward a little bit of this. Um, what we're doing in this next session is we're going to do the exact same thing, except this time we're going to use UDP. And so when we execute it this time, uh, you can see that because we just used UDP as the transport, it was picked up. So again, if we don't use something like mail slots or like I did a talk at DerbyCon a few years ago where we use wind divert to do similar things, um, if we use, don't use a transport like that and kind of hide that activity, then it can be picked up on uh, in ATW. But using mail slots is a way to bypass that. So now I'm going to go ahead and show it in Process Explorer. Um, and just for time's sake, again, uh, we're basically just showing the same thing. And so we're going to get that set up. We're going to go ahead and get our tool ready to execute the task. And then we're going to send it off. And as we can see that um, unlike before when we use task scheduler, it's not underneath a you know, SVC host. It's not associated with our OB service here it's shown to be or associated with explore.exe as the parent. It's in the target user and it's even recorded um, uh, here. So now the next question is, or hold on, let me just get this next one queued up. Okay, good. So how, how does this work? <clears throat> how are we achieving this? Um, two things. One is that we have our service running in session zero and it's running a system. So we need two specific privileges um, to carry this out, SE debug privilege, um, and that is for spoofing the parent creator process. And then we need SETCB privilege um, and that is required for creating a process in a different logon session from the caller. So this is like a really big requirement, the second part. Um, we're going to, so to spoof the parent versus just creating a process in the logon session and we actually want to spoof it, in order to do that, we're going to open a handle to the desired um, parent process, um, not the token, we're not stealing the token, we're just getting a handle to the process itself um, with create, uh, process create process. We're going to then uh, create a new uh, thread attribute list to handle this. Um, with this attribute and that's kind of the secret sauce. And then we have to determine what Windows API we're going to use to carry this out. Um, we're ending up, we're going to have to use create process as a user and the reason why is because, um, and this is demonstrated in the documentation, but um, if we use create process with a token, um, it's only going to be for the specific session that it's in. So basically the create process with token won't work if you're calling it from one session and the token is a session from a different user. So remember we're in session zero and we want to gain execution in a different session. So that was not going to work. So we're going to have to use create process as user. Um, but we don't want to, and this is actually what typically is done, but we don't want to access or steal a token from another process. So what do we do then? Windows has graciously, graciously given us um, a wonderful API, WTS query user token. Uh, WTS is the Windows Terminal Services API. You can imagine on a terminal server that you're going to want to have services being able to interact with logon sessions, right? And so this API is going to get a primary access token of the logged on user for a specified session. So we can be running in zero and we can use this Windows API to then get a primary access token for any logon session that we want. Um, in order to do this, we need to be running as NT authority system and we need to have the SCTCB privilege uh, enabled, which is available by default if you're running it at that level. 
what I couldn't be find to be documented and what actually create a lot of frustration for me developing this is that the caller must be running in session zero. So for instance, if you're, you know, download this code and you're testing it out and you're running the agent to do this and you're not in session zero, uh, but you're in a log on session, it's gonna fail, or at least it did for me on, uh, on everything. So that's a key component is that you have to be running in session zero um, as system for this, for the WTS query user token to actually obtain the token from another log on session. The next thing is can this be detected because what we saw is that process monitor uh, and process explorer they didn't capture this at all. So I mean if we're testing out malware or whatever we're using these tools we're not going to see this actually fire. So one why and then is the information available. The uh, next bit of information is by Pavel uh, Yusovic. Um, he has a really great write up um, over this and so I want, definitely want to give a shout out to him. So for kernel drivers that register the process creation notification with this uh, PS set create process notify routine and again this is in the kernel uh, driver. Um, this is basically a structure that you get and I got to speed up a little bit. Um, but you have these different things. So we have the handle parent create process ID. That is what process monitor and process explorer are using and this is the information that we're spoofing. So that now it makes sense because they're using kernel drivers to gather this activity and we're spoofing it. This is the bit of information they're, they're getting it from most likely. The next thing that uh, Pavel points out is that the creating thread ID is also within the struct and the real uh, creator process ID and parent can be obtained. Um, but the thing about it is that this information that it would actually show our malware service this information is lost at this point um, once, you know, this exits. So that information isn't stored in the e-process apparently. So what about ETW? So we can bypass and, you know, divert or we can bypass, you know, this uh, visibility within a kernel driver that isn't looking at the create thread process ID but just the parent process ID. But what about ETW? So we're going to go ahead and get it ready. We're going to go ahead and open up process monitor XV2 which again Pavel uh, created and is available on his GitHub and it is using uh, ETW versus like the you know kernel drivers that we were using within process monitor and process explorer. So we execute it. Now we're just going to go ahead and pause it and what we're going to see is that we do capture it. So from a defender perspective this can be captured using ETW um, because it does provide that information. Um, so that's a good sign for defenders, right? I was kind of hoping for the latter but yeah. Okay so we can see the command was executed as the user. Um, I just want to like end on this last demo is that uh, you know we do see this activity of spoofing the parent within ETW but we do not see it um, unless the kernel driver that's being used by the endpoint product is specifically looking for and looking within that other parameter within the structure. Um, I'm going to embrace this very quickly because I just have a few minutes left. Um, but the other thing is uh, looking at you know anti-debug and runtime awareness within your malware. Um, we're going to look at TSL or TLS callbacks, uh, thread hide from debugger, being debugged in environment variables. Uh, basically a bunch of different things I've used very successfully over the years. Um, <laughs> the first thing are TLS or TLS callbacks, thread local storage. <coughs> so these these are executed before a thread is created and so it's very useful because whenever a uh, process executes like you're going to have your main thread well if you implement you know TLS callbacks then that is going to be executed before main. So you can actually m you know implement whatever you want before the main function is ever called. Um, I didn't come up with this obviously this has been around for a minute but um, at least for me like actually getting this to work 
in the code available for it was, um, yeah, I really couldn't find it, but it's not necessarily malicious activity um, because it's using a lot of mainstream products, projects such as Chromium, which is where um, I reference here. But the key thing is that it's almost like a constructor, ability to have a constructor and destructor for threads. So you can have execution before it's, it's um, executed and after. So obviously we have execution very early in the execution of the process even before main is called. So thread hide from debugger, um, this technique has been very successful for me. Um, there's an attribute, <coughs> there's a, an attribute whenever you're creating a thread where you can set it to not being, a, like you can set it to not allow being debugged. And so when you create the thread and you say, hey, you know, hide from debugger, don't allow me to be debugged. If you debug that thread, the entire process crashes. So even if this is like a different thread other than main or whatever else, if you try to debug that process, the entire process, or that thread, that entire process will crash. Um, and this is just because for debugging purposes, obviously you'd have to have a thread running um, that isn't being debugged itself. Um, so the next thing is like, well, if we detect something that is happening that we don't want to happen, how can we leverage this? And so uh, we want to know if we're being debugged and if so, we want to take an action. Historically, a lot of, you know, cases you've used, uh, is debugger present? We don't want to do that um, because it's very obvious, but we don't have to. It's very simple. All we have to do is get the address of the process environment block, PEB, um, and then we can access the values. Um, the value at the offset of being debugged. So it's very simple. We basically get the address to PEB and then we get the offset and then we can identify if we're being debugged or not. Um, you can you know, use this in code entirely. This is fully working. But what we're showing here on the right is that we have our main function. It just simply types a number after getting some input. But above it, this is where we have our TLS callbacks. Um, function being created. So we're creating a thread. It's our anti-debug thread. So before main is called, we're going to execute this anti-debug thread. And um, then after that's set up, we're going to make it where it hides from the debugger. Within that, we're going to read the offset of being debugged within the PEB. And if we are being debugged, then we're going to add a breakpoint. <laughs> So if we add a breakpoint within a thread that is configured to not being debugged, the process crashes. Appreciate it. Um, the next thing is just basically just looking at environment variables. One key thing in a lot of sandboxes is that they're not domain joined. And so we can look at the user domain and computer, uh, computer name, compare them. If they are not, or if they are the same, then the box is not domain joined. So simply checking for this, can help you bypass a lot of like sandboxes um, because like in, you know, for what I'm doing, typically if we're executing something on a Windows endpoint, if it's not domain joined, then it's probably not something that we want to have our stuff execute on. So this can be used in conjunction with the TLS callbacks to have really early um, detection on, you know, the state of the machine and if we actually want to run our implant or not. So in conclusion, um, the implant messaging protocol that we've um, implemented, it has response, I'm sorry, it'll support unidirectional or bidirectional transports um, and you can um, have optional responses. Um, mail slots are available even if SMB v1 is disabled. Um, the network traffic from that activity is not, um, is disassociated from the server and client process. Um, it also supports broadcasting. One of the things in the demos that we didn't see because I was trying to hurry is that if you put a star or instead of the NetBIOS name and you send that out, then any implant within the domain network is going to receive that and execute. So we can send out one task and it'll propagate to everything in there. So if you want to target a specific user, we don't know where they are, we can send it out and then it'll just, it'll execute within that logon session if and where they're logged in. Again, authentication isn't required. We just went over like the uh, process uh, execution stuff and you know, spoofing the parent process. Key takeaways is, does your environment detect it? Does your stack uh, detect this? Are they looking at the correct things? Are these an ETW or their own drivers? You know, what is the state of your network and can they defend against this? 
And at this point, I'll go ahead and close. Again, thank you for being here. I know it's late in the day. Uh, huge Defcon fan, obviously. So yeah, I really appreciate being here.